Bolivia's first indigenous president, Evo Morales, who is an incredibly successful and popular left-wing socialist president, became the latest leader in Latin America to fall victim to a military coup backed by, you guessed it, the United States government. Now, you wouldn't necessarily know that that was the case if you only tuned into mainstream media who isn't giving people the full story. For example, this headline from the New York Times reads, Bolivian leader Evo Morales steps down. The CNN headline reads, Bolivian President Evo Morales steps down following accusations of election fraud. This video from CBS News says, Bolivian President Evo Morales resigns after election fraud and protests. This headline from Time Magazine reads, Bolivian President Evo Morales announces resignation amid protests. So based on these headlines, you'd assume that an unpopular president who was fraudulently elected is simply resigning due to public pressure. But that's not the case. What this is, is a military coup. It's a military coup by far-right opposition to Morales, who was emboldened by the U.S. government. Now, as Jake Johnson of Common Dreams reports, Bolivia's socialist president Evo Morales was forced to resign Sunday under threat from the nation's military police forces, and violent right-wing protesters who have burned and ransacked the homes of members of Morales' party, assaulted supporters of the president, and kidnapped a Bolivian mayor. So let's be crystal clear and call this what it is. This is a military coup. Now, the reason why we are seeing a coup happen in Bolivia is largely due to the far right, as I alluded to, being emboldened by the United States government. Now, how they were emboldened is explained to you in this Nation article by Mark Weisbrot, who explains, on October 20th, Bolivians went to the polls to choose their president and Congress. Evo Morales, the country's first indigenous president in a country with the largest proportion of indigenous people in Latin America, was on the ballot for re-election. His main opponent, former President Carlos Mesa, is vastly preferred by the Trump administration. Since Morales was elected in 2005, the U.S. government has been hostile and Bolivia has not had ambassadorial relations with the United States since 2009. Morales is one of the last remaining members of a cohort of independent left presidents who have been opposed and in some cases removed with the help of the United States. When the official tally was done, Morales had 47.1% of the vote, with 36.5% for Mesa in second place. This meant that Morales had won the presidency without going to a runoff because the rules allow for a first round win for a candidate that gets at least 40% of the vote at a 10 point margin over the closest competitor. The opposition cried foul long before the votes were counted. Mesa had already indicated that he would not accept the decision of the electoral authorities if Morales were to win. What is more surprising and disturbing was the press statement from the OAS the day after the election. It expressed, quote, deep concern and surprise at the drastic and hard to explain change in the trend of the preliminary results after the closing of the polls, but it did not present any evidence for its questioning of the election results. Hours before the OAS press statement and even longer before the votes were counted, Senator Marco Rubio stated falsely, quote, in Bolivia, all credible indications are Evo Morales failed to secure necessary margin to avoid second round in presidential election. He also alleged without evidence that there was some concern he will tamper with the results or process to avoid this. Trump administration officials followed with similar statements. The potentially violence-promoting claims of the OAS, which echo those of Rubio in the Trump administration, have driven much of the media's coverage and serve as an anchor for those who want to discredit the election. Now, the Organization of American States, the OAS, this is a multilateral organization who is ostensibly impartial. So whenever they say something, whenever they declare the results of any given country's election as legitimate or illegitimate, the media just tends to accept what they say, just accept their word, because, you know, this isn't just the United States who is issuing this declaration. They view them as a neutral arbiter, and most of the time, they're okay, although not always. They have undermined elections, as you're going to see. Now, the problem with the OAS is that the United States government has a disproportionate level of influence. Here's one example. In the 2000 national election in Haiti, the OAS at first decided that it was a great success for the Haitian population, which turned out in large and orderly numbers to choose both their local and national government. But the OAS later changed its position as Washington sought to destabilize and topple the government there. So this organization does the bidding of what the US government wants oftentimes because the US government has, again, 
a large amount of influence, a large amount of sway within this organization. Now, what makes this especially suspicious is what they're saying is fraudulent with regard to the Morales election. For those who bothered to look at the data, it was clear that the increase in the share of Morales votes in later returns was simply a result of geography. In other words, Morales support is much stronger among rural and poorer populations whose votes came in later. Such a geographically driven change in vote margins is not that uncommon in elections, as anyone who has watched election returns on television in the United States knows. And this change wasn't even that big of a shift. But that's really what they're basing their fraud claims on. And we just had an election in Seattle where there was a city council race where Shama Sawan, who's a socialist, was behind. And then all of a sudden she caught up and ended up winning because the mail-in ballots came in and she was heavily favored among those people who were mailing in their ballots. So, I mean, this really is nothing new. If you are a neutral observer and you see this then there's a perfectly reasonable and rational ex explanation for it. And the fact that this is what they're viewing as fraudulent or calling it to question the legitimacy of shows that something fishy is going on here, right? This stinks. Something's not right. Now, the problem is that once a narrative takes hold, it's really difficult to undo it. So the narrative became election fraudulent. The media ran with that. The right wing, the far right in Bolivia was emboldened. And then the rest was history. Morales was ousted once the military asked him to resign. And they only asked him out of courtesy because if he didn't agree to resign, they would have removed him forcefully. Now, in an interview with Democracy Now!, Mark Weisbrot explained how the media really fueled the flames of regime change by not being diligent enough. And I think it's really terrible the way it's been uh, presented because from the beginning, you had that OAS uh, press release the day after the election, which hinted or implied, actually, very strongly, that there was something wrong with the vote count. And they never presented any evidence at all. They didn't present it in that release. They didn't present it in their next release. They didn't present it in their preliminary report. And there's really nothing in this uh, latest uh, so-called preliminary audit that shows that there was any fraud in this election. But it was repeated over and over again uh, in all the media, and so it, it became kind of true. And, you know, if you look at the media, you don't see anybody—you don't see any experts, for example, uh, saying that there was something wrong with the vote count. It's really just that OAS observation mission, which was under a lot of pressure, of course, from uh, Senator Rubio and uh, the Trump administration. Uh, to do this, because they wanted, they've wanted for some time to get rid of this government. In terms of the Trump administration, you can look at uh, tweets and statements from uh, Marco Rubio, right, uh, before the votes were even counted, uh, saying that there was going to be fraud and, uh, you know, making it clear that they didn't want this uh, government to be there. And so, yeah, I think that—I mean, it's very obvious that they supported this group, and it's very obvious that they uh, pressured uh, the OAS, uh, where, you know, the United States supplies 60 percent of the budget. And, you know, this is the problem. The media treats this uh, OAS as though it's really an independent arbiter here. And they do have electoral missions, and most of the time uh, they're clean, but they are not always. And, uh, you know, in, in Haiti in 2011, for example, they reversed the results of a first-round uh, presidential election without any statistical test, recount, or any reason. It was completely political. And in 2000, uh, they reversed their position, their report on the election, when the United States, as you know and you've reported on this show, uh, wanted to cut off all international aid to Haiti and uh, spent four years preparing for the coup of uh, 2004. So, uh, the OAS played a major role in that by changing their report on the uh, election in Haiti. And so, I think uh, this, is, this is a kind of a classic uh, military coup uh, supported by the United States. So, Mark Weisbrot, you have the CIA involvement in coups in Bolivia in 1952, in 1964, 1970, 1980. Would you add 2019 to that list? I would add it to the list. I mean, we don't have the hard evidence of what they did. You know, it's not like 2009 in Honduras, where Hillary Clinton wrote in her memoirs that she uh, worked uh, in the OAS, too, uh, to uh, prevent 
the elected uh, president, uh, who you've had on this show, uh, from coming back to the country and to the presidency. But I, I think we'll probably find out more later. But it's it's just it is it is very obvious um, that they supported <clears throat> this coup. So, I mean, there you have it. If you are familiar with the United States's history, well, this isn't surprising. Like, this is just another chapter in a very long story of the U.S. doing what we want in a region of the world that wants autonomy, right? We don't like the results of their elections, so what do we do? Well, our government acts to change it by undermining the legitimacy and support of said legitimately elected government. And we have installed brutal dictators before. Allende was elected in Chile, and who did we put in place? We backed Augusto Pinochet, who was an absolute monster. He was a totalitarian leader who created a police state. This was our doing. So we keep doing this over and over again. We keep lobbying for regime change in Latin America. And then once we undermine these regimes, then we claim that, you know, socialism and these socialist regimes, they don't work. But the thing about Evo Morales is he's been really successful at driving down poverty in Bolivia and driving up Bolivia's GDP. This is someone who is the real deal. So he talked about how he was disappointed in Obama because he thought that Obama was the change candidate. I'm paraphrasing, of course. And he even endorsed Bernie Sanders for president, saying, We congratulate Brother Bernie Sanders, who, according to the press, moves forward the U.S. presidential nomination. We are confident this progressive leader will have a strong support from the people of the U.S. Democratic revolutions are built upon democratic elections. Now, on top of that, he challenged the United States and their hegemony in a very direct way to Donald Trump's face. The United States could not care less about human rights nor justice. If this were the case, it would have signed the international conventions and treaties for the protection of human rights. It would not have threatened the investigation mechanisms of the International Criminal Court, nor would it promote the use of torture nor would it have walked away from the Human Rights Council, and nor would it have separated migrant children from their families, nor put them in cages. Few Latin American leaders have done that because they're probably afraid of the repercussions. If you challenge the United States, you are challenging a behemoth who could very easily undermine you and potentially overthrow you. So this is absolutely um, just... I want to say that it's shocking, but this really isn't surprising. This is what the United States have been do has been doing. Look at this tweet from Zach Carter, who he really goes through the list of how many times the United States has backed a military coup in Latin America. And we've done this again and again and again. And this is just what we've come to expect as the norm in the United States. We back coups whenever there is a president in place that we don't like. This is what we do. It's unacceptable. Now, this is someone who is a socialist who's actually been successful at ameliorating poverty, at making sure that he puts the interests of his country first, and he's not kowtowing to the United States, as many Latin American leaders feel inclined to do. Now, I want to share the reaction from some political leaders in the United States and abroad because I think that they have some really useful and important insight. Bernie Sanders tweeted, I am very concerned about what appears to be a coup in Bolivia, where the military, after weeks of political unrest, intervened to remove President Evo Morales. The U.S. must call for an end to violence and support Bolivia's democratic institutions. Ilhan Omar tweets, There's a word for the president of a country being pushed out by the military. It's called a coup. We must unequivocally oppose political violence in Bolivia. Bolivians deserve free and fair elections. Labour leader in the UK, Jeremy Corbyn, tweeted to see Evo Morales, who along with a powerful movement has brought so much social progress forced from office by the military, is appalling. I condemn this coup against the Bolivian people and stand with them for democracy, social justice, and independence. So when we talk about this, let's be very clear. This is a military coup, and we have to educate people since the mainstream media in the United States isn't doing their job. If they knew that this was another attempt at regime change by the United States government, they probably wouldn't be too happy about that. So what the media does is they kind of reframe the situation, they code it, they hide things that they don't necessarily want you to see. And maybe this isn't even deliberate. Maybe this is something that they're just doing unwittingly. But we have to be clear and speak out. This is a military coup. This is an attempt at regime change, successfully so thus far. 
and it's unacceptable. Anyone who cares about ending regime change wars, ending US-backed military coups, has got to condemn this, because this is something that cannot keep happening. We say we believe in democracy. We say that we believe in, you know, the freedom to choose your elected leaders. So we have to actually respect that for once and allow the people of Bolivia to um, make their own decision. We saw the same thing happen in Venezuela, right? Where you had a far-right opposition challenge the left-wing government. Now, what the right-wing individuals in these countries know is that if they truly don't like a left-wing leader, all they have to do is lobby the U.S. government to get involved and they can have the U.S. government take out their political opponents for them. So we have to be very, very careful here when we talk about this. We have to make sure that we're clear and we don't mince words. This is a U.S.-backed coup. We believe in self-determination for the people of Bolivia and anyone who's not speaking out against this needs to do so fast because this is completely unacceptable.